Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with conservation districts, we're a local non-regulatory government agency. Uh, we act similar to a water or school district, but our focus is in natural resource conservation. Uh, so that means we help residents of King County uh, steward their backyards, their school grounds, community gardens, farms, forests, shoreline areas, and we help protect our soil health and water quality. Uh, basically, anything that's kind of under the domain of natural resources is the areas that we work in. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm so excited to see so many people here today. Um, my name is Madeline. Like Nick said, I'm the Education Program Coordinator at KCD, and I have a background in restoration uh, as well as environmental education with all ages. So I love to talk about native plants. So this is a fun one for me to do. I am getting over a little bit of a cold. So if my voice is sounding a little froggy or um, if I have to cough for a minute, I apologize for that. Um, but we are gonna get going today. Um, and like Nick said, please put all your questions in the chat and we'll definitely get to as many of those as we have time for. And so the first thing we really want to think about when we talk about native plants is native to where. Um, and for our purposes, when we say native plants, we're re really referring to the Puget Lowlands in western Washington. So this area approximately in the green circle, um, the low elevation area kind of sandwiched between the Puget Sound and the Olympic Mountains on one side and the Cascade Mountains on the other side. So this area has unique growing conditions. So while you may see these plants that grow here, also growing in Eastern Washington, also growing in Oregon or up into British Columbia, they are adapted to our specific conditions here. Um, and so that's where we really wanna look when we're reforesting our backyards, our community areas um, and our stream sides. And why do we want to use native plants? Um, for us at a conservation district, um, this really boils down to protecting water quality, which is a big focus of ours. We're also supporting native wildlife when we use native plants. And especially if, if you're work, if you're doing this work in your backyard or some somewhere very close to your home, um, the landscape aesthetic is also probably important to you. So we're going to talk about kind of all three of these, these issues today. All right. So um, when we talk about water quality, this is a really big one, right? We, especially in the Puget Sound region, we know that uh, the water, the quality of our water in our rivers, creeks, and streams impacts the Puget Sound, impacts our orcas and this whole food web that we're all a part of. Um, so native plants really do help improve our water quality by preventing uh, erosion and absorbing water before it runs into any water body. And what that does is it helps filter out pollutants. Um, so in a natural area like the one on the left, we can have up to 50% of that storm water that's falling from the sky infiltrating into the soil, the plants, the ground. And that's compared to only 15% that you see on the urban area in the right. Um, and that's because all of those buildings and roads, those are impervious surfaces. They don't absorb water um, like our native plant covered ground does. Um, so you'll see that in that, in that, urban area, we're only getting, we're, we're getting 55% of stormwater that's hitting the ground and running off into our water bodies. Um, and on its way to our water bodies, it's picking up toxins and pollutants that it's carrying there. So we see a huge, huge difference just in the amount of stormwater in our environment when we utilize native plants. Native plants also prevent erosion and that keeps those soil sediments out of our water and can keeping those soil particles out of our water is another big way that native plants improve water quality. Um, their root systems are really, really good at holding soil in place, not letting it run away in the rain and the wind. Uh, and you can see that even though some of our weedy plants that we find in this area above ground might look similar to our native plants, that below ground, those root systems are doing totally different things. So our native plants often grow far deeper and more extensive, more fibrous root systems that do a much better job of holding our soils in place. 
So we also definitely see benefits to wildlife when we have more native plants in the landscape. And that's because, because native animals have evolved alongside our native plants um, and many are dependent on each other to thrive. So planting native plants in your yard means providing not only more space for wildlife to enjoy your yard and for you to enjoy wildlife, but also supporting those interdependent relationships. And native plants are especially important for insects that support the very base of our food webs. Um, and many insects, including caterpillars, are specialized to eat only one or a couple species of native plants. And many caterpillars can't eat our weedy plants at all. So the reason I'm talking so much about caterpillars is they're actually an essential part of the food web for many of our songbirds. Um, so the thing about caterpillars, right, is they don't have a hard exoskeleton and they're really fat and juicy. So these are basically like easy to digest um, protein filled morsels for baby birds. So a lot of songbirds are relying on these caterpillars um, to feed their young. So one example of this is this is a dark eyed junco nest. A dark eyed junco is one of our native birds um, and throughout their adulthood, they eat seeds, berries and insects. But while they are raising chicks, they actually switch to a diet that's almost entirely composed of insects, especially caterpillars. Um, and they can require thousands and thousands of caterpillars to raise and fledge one nest of chicks. So our urban and suburban backyards with a lot of native plants can attract three times as many native birds to visit your yard and also to nest there. So this is a way that you actually are making a huge difference just in your backyard. And in general, if one of your goals is to support wildlife, just planting a wide variety of native plants is really the way to go. Uh, we also don't want to forget our landscape aesthetics. We, Many of us, I think, we, we want to live in a place that where we're surrounded by this natural beauty. And you can still do that with native plants. Um, they not only provide those water quality and wildlife benefits that I talked about, but they're really beautiful themselves. And they provide this very regionally distinct feel um, that's really indicative of the area we live in. So I really encourage everyone to kind of embrace the look of the Pacific Northwest rather than fighting it. And there's still a lot of ways, you know, you don't have to live in this wild overgrown yard. Um, this photo is a really great example of how someone kind of used some layering around the edges of their backyard as it kind of moves into that more natural space. So something like that can be a really nice transitional area. Creating layers in the landscape is not only nice for those aesthetics, um, it's also just really good for water quality and habitat. Um, so you'll provide the most erosion prevention and water quality by layering your plants. And that's because having tree shrubs and ground cover at different heights means that rainfall will be intercepted at many different places on its way down and there will be less runoff and more stormwater infiltration. Less runoff, right, also means less erosion. So we like that as well. Um, an additional note is that if you include evergreen plants in your planting plan, so those plants that don't leave lose their leaves in the winter, they provide these benefits year round, not just during the growing season. Um, and if you have layers in your landscape, you're also providing better habitat for wildlife um, that needs shelter and lives at a variety of uh, heights in the landscape. So I've talked a lot about native plants, but I also just really quick want to call out kind of the opposite of what I'm talking about is our weeds. Um, so we have many, many weeds in this area. And if you're interested in learning more about these weeds, we'll share out some resources in an email tomorrow. Um, and you can also visit the King County Noxious Weeds websites for a ton of great educational resource on weeds. Um, and weedy plants in general, right, they were introduced from other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And for whatever reason, when they landed here, our growing conditions just really worked out for them. And they're able to take advantage of that um, and spread. They often um, are kind of crowding out or out competing our native plants, leading to these like monocultures or just like many of you have probably seen like the field of blackberry, the forest that's all ivy. Um, not these diverse native landscapes that we're talking about. So some of our big weeds that we deal with here, right? Of course, Himalayan blackberry, um, 
can be a big problem for many people. It does create those monocultures just of blackberry. They shade out all of the plants around them and grow very, very quickly. Butterfly bush, despite the fact that you do see that butterfly, <laughs> excuse me, sitting on that bush, um, they're not actually that useful for caterpillars. Um, they don't they don't help out those insects the same way that we we like to see native plants do for our native insects. And they create seed heads that create thousands of seed per head that are spread by wind and water. So really can spread very, very quickly. Ivy in the middle here, um, it is a vine, but it also will cover the ground and once again, kind of smother out compete native plants on the ground. Um, one big problem that we see with ivy is that it grows up trees. There's not really a limit to, or I have not seen yet a limit of how high and big ivy can get. Some people will say that it is smothering or strangling the trees. That's a common misconception. The big problem with ivy on trees is that it's adding a huge amount of weight and surface area. So what it's doing is creating a very heavy sail. So when the wind comes through, the tree is heavier, it has more surface area, it's very easy to get knocked down in, in the wind in those circumstances. And then laurel, which is this plant with the really waxy, shiny green leaves. It grows as a tree. It can get very, very large. Um, you'll see it often in shrubs. In addition to outcompeting native plants for soil and water resources, the nutrient, soil, nutrient, and water resources, um, it also has a characteristic called allelopathy, where those fallen leaves, the root system, and the berries can actually alter the soil chemistry around it and make it more difficult for new native plants to grow. So this is just a highlight of some of our weeds and why we find them uh, kind of troublesome in our, in our natural environments. So when we are talking about native plants, um, we really want you to pick the right plant for the right place because you're putting in all of the effort, all of this effort to bring native plants um, back to our landscape. So we want to make sure they survive and thrive. And there are several factors to consider um, when you're choosing what plants to put in a specific site. But really the big ones, right, are sunlight and water. All plants need sunlight and water to grow. So you really want to think about those conditions exactly where you're planting. Um, and to think about that, we really need to think about soil. So we're going to talk a little bit about geology and soil real quick. It can be helpful when you're thinking about sunlight and water availability to make yourself a little map of the area you'll be planting. Um, you're welcome to do this on paper. You don't need to use an online tool like King County IMAP. If you have a larger site, King County IMAP is a great resource um, that'll also estimate the area of your site. Um, but it's totally fine to just lay this out on pen and paper and make sure you're outlining. Um, you'll see in this planting area, they have a wet and sunny zone, they have a dry sun and mixed shade zone, and then they have a dry and full sun zone. So just thinking about that can help you think about what types of native plants you'll need for your specific location. All right, so now getting back to soils real quick. Um, in our area, glacier, the glacial history of our area is really what has influenced our soils. Um, so glaciers had a huge impact on soils in our region. And 14,000 years ago, the area most of you are probably joining me from tonight used to be under a half a mile thick sheet of ice. Uh, this was called the Puget Lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. And the glacier is responsible for carving out the Puget Lowlands. For the purpose of our talk today, this glacier did three things. It created that hard pan, which if you've been digging in your backyard and you've gotten You've hit a layer with your shovel that you just can't dig through. Um, that is our hard pan. And the glacier created that. It left this glacial outwash till, which is many, for many of us, that's probably the soil we have in our backyard. It's very sandy, very rocky. And then it formed our river valleys where deposits of mucky soils accumulated. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So this is just a picture of a glacier in Canada and not the glacier that was covering, um, you know, our area 14,000 years ago. Unfortunately, we don't have photos of that one. 
Um, and as the glacier moves across the landscape, it pushes soils out in front of it. And this is called that glacial outwash that I referenced. Uh, this, outwash, this outwash is really well-drained, sandy, rocky, um, so it gets very droughty or dry in the summer. And this is the sort of material that makes up the majority of the hills around the Puget Sound. And it's, it's what's left over after that glacier departed. So we do have a lot of variation locally um, and that layer of hard pan. So depending on the height of the water table and the depth of the hard pan, even though you might have this, this very droughty glacial outwash till on top of your hard pan, if the hard pan is very close to the top of that, um, you might still have problems with drainage because not only is that hard pan difficult to dig through, but water is not going to drain through it well either. So it is important to learn about your specific site, knowing that these are the conditions that influenced it. Yes. Um, and this is just an example. You can really see and imagine how the soil is not great at holding on to moisture. Now, the glacial till is not present in our valley bottoms, but the glacier did carve out our valleys here in the Puget Sound region. So think of, you know, the Kent River Valley, uh, where the Green River flows, the Snoqualmie Valley out east. Um, these were all created by that glacier. And then as rivers came in, those rivers flooded and receded, flooded and receded. And every time they did that, they deposited this beautiful, mucky, fertile soil in those river valley bottoms. Um, these soil types are some of the most productive in our region. So there's a lot of agricultural land where they are. And they don't have that same hard pan because it's just covered by so many layers of thick, beautiful soil. Um, so if you do have soil like this, congratulations. That is um, it's really a very different story to garden in, in that soil than our glacial outwash. Um, and it's very different than those droughty hills that we talked about. So now that we've considered how our soils are able to hold on to water, we also need to think about sunlight and the sun conditions that our plants are getting. Um, and so we're gonna think about aspect. You can see on this picture that we have hills facing in different directions and the hills facing to the left of this photograph are all you know, green and growing strong. The hills facing to the right of the photograph are um, much drier, much hotter it looks like, right? They have less greenery on them. So slope and aspect are gonna really play a role in how much sunlight your plants are gonna get. Uh, and if you're in a more urban area, you can also pay attention to structures that are gonna shade your area, like houses, garage, large trees, um, anything that's changing how the area will be exposed to light throughout the day. And in the Northern Hemisphere, we see a pretty big difference on those East versus West facing slopes. Um, and that's because the sun, right, when we're in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun is generally moving towards the South, to the South of us. So what we see is that the sun rises in the East and that in the mornings, there's a lot of dew on plants, air temperatures are colder. So when the sun rises, it hits some pretty cold slopes. As the day warms up and the sun tracks to the west where it's gonna set, it hits those western slopes when air temperatures are a lot warmer. And so it increases the, the temperature of those western facing slopes a lot more. Uh, so that tends to be a better place for those like sun loving plants while the eastern slopes might be better for um, more shade, shade liking plants. We also see a difference on north versus south exposure. Um, once again, just because the sun is traveling to the south of us, the, the south facing slopes are gonna get more of that direct sunlight heating them up a little bit more. So when you're selecting your plants, just to recap, um, you wanna pick plants that are gonna grow well in your soil and light conditions. You wanna go for a diversity of heights and you wanna include some evergreen plants so you get those benefits year round. 
And then you also want to consider your needs and goals with your planting project. So that could be something like aesthetics, available space, whether the plants produce flowers or berries, how they support pollinators, all sorts of things. I'll share out a spreadsheet tool that we have that'll allow you to sort plants in our plant sale by some of these different um different characteristics to help you narrow down what you can plant. All right, and if anybody had any questions um, related to kind of this first portion of the talk, just making sure we're all on the same page before we move on and talk about some specific plants, I can address those now. Unless we get some questions rolling in, I think a lot of these are, so far, these questions are pretty general. So we Okay, can great. And we'll definitely get to those like more plant specific questions. Yeah, at the end of the presentation. So I will keep going. Thanks, Zoe. All right, so let's talk about some native plants. Um, and for every plant that I'm presenting, you're going to see three names at the top of the screen. Um, first, you'll see the common name, which is the name that I use when talking about plants, when communicating about plants. I think it, it tend to, tends to be the easiest and the most accessible. The problem we run into with common names is that sometimes plants have the same or similar common names as each other. And in that case, it is helpful to know the Latin name if you're like shopping for that plant. If you're going to a nursery and you want to make sure that you're you're getting the, the plant that's like actually native to this area, it can be really helpful to come prepared with the Latin name. And then I'm also sharing the Lushootsi names on here. Uh, Lushootsi is the language of many Coast Salish people and they've stewarded these plants since time immemorial. So I think that sharing those Lushootsi names just can, can help us honor their connection to the plants. Um, and our first plant is one of my favorites, I think one of many restorationist favorites at the Western Red Cedar um, is a truly, it's a beautiful conifer. It's really unique to our area. It has these drooping branches that hang like a skirt. The bark is de disease and rot resistant that can be really beautiful red colors. Um, they grow to an average of 150 feet tall, but they can get taller than that if the if the have time and conditions are good. Um, and they're used by 45 different butterfly and moth species. So this is a wonderful tree for attracting birds and wildlife to your yard, as well as providing a lot of those water quality benefits that I talked about. The shore pine typically grows only around 40 to 50 feet. So this is a smaller conifer, it makes it a great option if you want a nice conifer tree, but have just a little less space. They can also grow in a huge variety of growing conditions. They're definitely generalists everywhere from the coast where they're getting hit by, you know, wind and salt spray and they grow in a really contorted pattern. Um, they also grow, you know, up onto our mountain slopes where they're growing in a much straighter form. They're really an, another important species for many animals in Washington because they have nutritious oily seeds. So a lot of um, birds and small mammals really use those for food. And the pine needles can be a great material for birds making nests because they're so long. And just to note that we'll be sending out resources on native plants so you can learn all about their preferred growing conditions. You don't have to, you know, necessarily furiously write everything down now. Grand fir, another beautiful conifer tree. This one can get 300 feet tall, so definitely a big guy. And it's one of our fastest growing conifers. So if you want those like benefits that conifers, big conifers provide quickly, this is a good option for you. It has a very upright trunk and cones that stand straight up from the branch rather than hanging below. Uh, great one for supporting, supporting our food webs because 124 butterfly and moth species are known to use this plant in Western Washington. And it likes sun to partial shade and soil that is well-drained but moist. Gary Oak, which you'll also hear called Oregon White Oak is Washington's only native oak. Uh, it's a beautiful de deciduous tree growing around 80 feet tall. It has this really like beautiful gnarly shape, rounded lobes, leaves, and acorns that provide food for food for people and wildlife, um, including the gray squirrel, which is considered a threatened species. 
they have some pretty specific growing conditions that they prefer and they're really associated with our prairie soils especially in south puget sound um so this is a great tree but definitely look into if it's right for your site and oaks in general support a huge variety of native insects um and along with pine trees are considered you know one of the most important species in washington for wildlife we're moving into some smaller plants, might be more manageable for a backyard, um, but we have cascara, which is a deciduous tree with these deeply veined leaves. You get some nice fall color with those leaves. Um, insect eating species are really attracted to cascara, so kinglets, chickadees, nuthatches, some of our cuter birds, uh, and they eat those little berries that, that ripen to that like kind of dark blue black color. Um, the berries are not super palatable for people. They do definitely have a laxative effect. Um, so this is a great one just to plant for wildlife and they grow in full sun to partial shade and in moister soils. Vine maple, which is uh, definitely a favorite tree for a lot of people here. They're, they're small, only 12 to 25 feet. So great for backyards. Um, they prefer moist soils and generally prefer mixed sun and shade. Um, they can struggle a little bit in full hot sun. And in the winter and fall, their leaves are going to become super vibrant. The more sun it gets, the redder the leaves are going to become. They also produce these very small red and white flowers, which I think go unnoticed by most people, but are actually have co-evolved with one of our native um, bees. So they're really important for that bee species. And in general, once again, we're seeing over 125 butterflies and moths use this as a host plant for their caterpillars. <coughs> red osier dogwood. Um, this is a great one for moist to wet areas, but can do some drier spots occasionally. Um, it has these clusters of small flowers, so not the big flowers you see on some dogwood trees. Uh, and their berries, those white berries, can, can stay on the bush into the winter. So those are an important winter food source for thrushes, robins, vireos, and warblers. Um, the newer growth, the stems are bright red, so they can add color to your garden even in the winter. And they provide great winter browsing for deer and elk. Um, so if you live somewhere with deer and elk, this is this is a great plant that can even, once it reaches a, a reasonable size, can stand up to that browsing as well. And they won't just totally decimate your plant. Twin berries are another, uh, another great shrub. The flowers attract a ton of pollinators, including hummingbirds. Uh, this plant is called twinberry because its berries always grow in pairs, like you can see here. And the berries are not great for humans. Uh, another one that just kind of probably has that, that laxative effect for us, maybe a little bit of a stomach ache. Um, but they are great for the birds. We are very lucky to live in a place that, that doesn't really, we don't have native plants that that are gonna cause serious problems for you, but we do have enough that, that you probably are not interested in eating because they're not gonna make you feel great. Thimbleberry, I think I am not alone in having this be my favorite berry. I've heard that from, from many, many other people. It's also a really beautiful plant um, and it doesn't have thorns. So if you're looking for a berry without thorns, this might be for you. The leaves are super, super large and soft. So you'll also hear it called toilet paper berry, just referencing another possible human use for this plant. Um, the berries are small and red and similar to the shape of a raspberry or blackberry, they could fit on the end of your thumb like a thimble. Native pollinators really love this big white flower that, that blooms on there and birds will enjoy the berries. So if you do wanna eat them, um, you may have to beat the birds to them. This species doesn't grow super tall, but it does spread over time. So if you're looking for something to fill space, that, that might be desirable to you. Um, otherwise, you might want to have a plan for pruning it back, although it's not going to be as, as an aggressive a spreader as some of our other, other spreading thicket-forming plants that I'll mention later. All right, red elderberry. Um, this is a shrub that can grow to the size of a small tree. It prefers moist and shady areas, but it can do more sun as long as it has that soil moisture to support it. It produces these red berries that have been an important 
um, staple food for Pacific Northwest peoples. Um, some people find that the berries can cause some nausea when they're eaten raw. So I definitely recommend um, reading up on this plant and the best way to prepare it if you're interested in using it um, for, for food uh, or any medicinal purposes. Um, regardless of whether you're interested in using the berries, birds are going to love this one, including hummingbirds going, going for those fluffy white um, blooms that it gets on it. And at the KCD plant sale, we sell red and blue elderberry. Um, blue is typically found maybe more on the east side of the state in those drier areas. Um, and it has blueberries instead of red, but they are very similar plants. So talking about more of our thicket forming plants, um, great for say you removed a bunch of blackberry and you want to fill that space before the blackberry comes back. Salmonberry might be a great option for you because it does form those big dense thickets. Uh, it does really well in moist soil and partial shade and they grow these beautiful pink magenta flowers. Um, great for many types of pollinators, including some beetles. The berries are not only beautiful, but they're edible for, for animals as well as people. Um, some people really like them. Some people don't like them as much. I don't find them as sweet as some of our other native berries, but they're, they're definitely a treat when you get a good one. And salmonberry, like I said, can really spread over time. So definitely plant it in a place where that spreading um, will be okay or be prepared with a pruning plan. Pacific nine bark. Um, I think this is kind of like an underrated native plant for, for backyard plantings, but I think it's really beautiful. It can survive in wet or moist areas. Um, it doesn't like to dry out totally. The plant has really beautiful white and pink blooms um, that become these pink seed pods. So not only do they add beauty for your garden, um, but they're a valuable food resource for wildlife, even into the winter, because those seed pods stay on the plant for quite a long time. The plant is called nine bark because of its unique peeling bark uh, that people believed grew in nine layers. That's not quite true, but you can see those layers of bark there. All right, oh so berry. Um, this one I love because this is often our first sign of spring here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's a shrub, it doesn't get too dense, and the flowers can bloom as early as February. So like I said, if you're a person who needs that sign in February, like the sun is coming back, winter will be over eventually, um, this is a great plant for that. And not only does it have, you know, those mental health benefits for us of reminding us that the seasons will change, um, but because it blooms so early, it's a really important food source for pollinators who are kind of looking for that first nectar snack of the new year. Um, and then also birds who are going to love to eat those berries that also ripen quite early. Um, the berries are produced by female plants um, with a male plant growing nearby. And it's unlikely you'll see these berries hanging on for long. They are technically edible for us. They have a pretty big seed inside and they're not very sweet. Um, so while you could eat them, I would say it's better just to leave these ones for those hungry birds who've been surviving off less desirable things uh, late into the winter. Red flower and currant, super popular, as you can probably guess by just seeing the picture of these beautiful pink flowers. It likes sunny areas to partial shade and dry to moist but well-drained soil. The flowers are truly spectacular. Uh, they attract a ton of pollinators, especially hummingbirds. The berries are edible, but they're not very sweet and they should be cooked before being eaten. So this is another one to, to read about a little more before you start just like picking them off the bush and eating them. Um, they're you, they're, those berries are definitely used by wildlife um, and they can attract a ton of birds to your garden. So really commonly used in landscaping, um, can get to be a fairly large size shrub, but doesn't spread. So just a great, great option. Another landscaping favorite is the mock orange. Um, they like dry to rocky soil and moderate sunlight. The flowers, they just get covered in these big, white, really lovely, fragrant flowers. Um, I, you can smell them from a really far ways away sometimes. So nice for us, great for pollinators. Um, because the plant grows so, you know, leafy, um, they're a great 
habitat for juncos, thrushes, chickadees, gross beaks, um, and finches. So those birds are getting, you know, food and shelter from these plants. Ocean spray. Um, this is a, a shrub that can kind of grow to maybe a small tree size, uh, dry to moist soils and in sun or shade, so nice and flexible. Um, the flowers typically bloom in June and they're these beautiful creamy sprays like the, you know, the sea, the sea foam on a, on a crashing wave, how it's got its name. And these flowers produce brick colored seeds that hold on to the plant for much of the year. Um, so another great winter food source for birds and wildlife. Nutka rose, one of our native roses. Um, this is another really Thicket forming plant. It also gets pretty tall, up to nine feet tall, and it spreads rhizominously. That just means that it grows shoots underground um, that grow horizontally from the original plant and then shoot up. So it really is a rapid spreader, which can be desirable, like I said, if, if you're trying to fill a space. Maybe you want a native privacy hedge um, instead of a laurel. Maybe you did just do a big weed removal project and you want to keep those weeds from returning, then Nook Carose might be a great option for you. Probably not a great great option if you only have a small space. Um, the roses are large and pink, um, great for bumblebees, as well as many other pollinators. And those rose hips remain on the stems during the winter. Um, so not only are they providing winter color, but they can be another winter food source for wildlife. Although I don't think they're at the top of anyone's list for eating. Um, they are a source of vitamin C, so they have been used for rose hip tea. <laughs> the nut rose does like a fair amount of sun. Pacific rhododendron, our Washington state flower. Um, many of you will recognize this one. It has beautiful, large pink flowers and evergreen leaves. So you're getting those evergreen benefits from this plant. Um, they enjoy moist, acidic soils that's well-drained and partial shade to full sun. While they can get up to 25 feet tall, you'll often see them closer to six to seven feet tall, so they can definitely work in a smaller spaces. Um, and just be warned that they are slow growing. So if you plant this plant and don't see it take off right away, um, it's not necessarily unexpected or a problem. There's a nice big thicket of rhododendrons. Snowberry is a great plant if you want something that is going to spread a little bit more, but not too tall and not too aggressive. Um, they like dry to moist soils with moderate sun. The individual leaves can really vary in shape, so they add visual interest. Um, and like I said, they form these thickets that wildlife really like, but aren't like overwhelming for us if we're maintaining a backyard or a smaller space. Uh, they produce small pink flowers and these white berries, um, how they got their name. They're not edible for us. And I don't even think they're very tasty for birds, but they do stay on the, the bush long into the winter. And so at a certain point, birds will eat them. Um, moving back to though a plant that many of us do enjoy eating, evergreen huckleberry. Um, this is a great evergreen shrub. It grows these tiny little cute pink flowers um, that become delicious berries in the late summer, early fall. Uh, they, so they attract a ton of birds and mammals to enjoy those berries. And they're also a favorite of people um, who enjoy eating them straight off the bush or using them in jams, pies, and syrups. We're going to talk about a few smaller ground cover. Deer fern has a more delicate appearance compared to our sword ferns that are pretty common too. Uh, the edges of the leaves are smooth and rounded and the plant grows to around two feet wide and a foot tall. They have two different types of fronds. The sterile frond lays close to the ground and the fertile fronds which stands straight up and is more narrow. They like to grow in moist areas um, with a decent amount of shade. Kinnikinnik is one of my favorite native ground covers. It's an evergreen trailing ground cover that can form thick mats um, and like sandy well-drained soils and can cascade really beautifully over a rock wall. The berries are edible, but they're a bit mealy and bland uh, and they ripen late in the season. So this is one I would recommend leaving for the wildlife. And because those berries are red and this is an evergreen, if you're looking for a native alternative to holly, this might be a good option. 
Salal is a small shrub with egg-shaped egg evergreen leaves, um, cute little bell-shaped pink flowers, and it produces um, purple droop-like berries. It does well in sunny and shady conditions, and it's a really common understory story species in Western Washington forests, and we can eat these berries. Sword ferns are super popular here in the Pacific Northwest, a huge part of our native landscape. They can grow to be around four feet wide, um, and they, they can live in a really wide variety of conditions. Fronds will die back every year. You can leave those at the base of the plant. They just act as mulch, and they improve, you know, they retain, retain water and suppress weeds in the soil. They also are great habitat um, for amphibians like the western redback salamander, uh, and the roots of the sword fern are exceptionally fantastic for erosion control. So if you're on a slope or dealing with erosion issues, sword fern is a, is a great direction to go. Our last native plant is one that I, I hope people will plant more of because I think it's super fun. Um, orange honeysuckle is a vining plant, um, but unlike ivy, it, it doesn't really get big enough to weigh down our trees like ivy does and cause those problems. It also will just go across the ground if it, it doesn't have a support structure. Um, but this is a great option for like a fence line or a place where you might not have room for a big, you know, shrubby bush or, or even something smaller. Um, as you can tell by the shape of those flowers, this is a really popular one for hummingbirds. Um, this is a great time to note though that actually hummingbirds, um, despite kind of our assumptions that, that they're nectar is most of their diet. It's actually 80% of their diet is made up of insects. So this is a great plant to meet some of those nectar needs and then planting other native plants to support the insect diets of hummingbirds um, is really what's going to get them to your yard year round. All right, so that was a lot of plants. Like I said, we're going to send out resources <laughs> so you can revisit these and many more native plants, figure out what will work best for you in your space. Um, but let's go on to like actually getting these plants in the ground and planting them. So plants are going to come in, in three different types of plant stock generally, and they all have some pros and cons. So we're going to go through those. Potted plants. Um, this is what you're probably going to see, you know, in the nursery, at the grocery store, um, really, really common is pots in gallon or even larger pots. Um, so some benefits of working with potted plants is they have really good survival rates. Um, they're very available. Like I said, like oftentimes you can even get them at the grocery store. There's a lot of wholesale nurseries around here. I can send out the list of nurseries um, in King County after this talk. They're also pretty easy to plant. So if you're working with kids or volunteers, this is a great choice. Um, and they're hardy for holding on site. So that means you can bring them to your site in their pot and leave them as long as they're staying moist and getting watered. Um, they don't have to get in the ground right away. You can also kind of arrange them at your site and, and really get down your spacing and your plant arrangement. <coughs> Some downsides of potted plants is they're definitely the most expensive option. So a gallon pot can cost over $15 and the price definitely goes up if you want a larger plant. Um, because they're in potting soil, that, that does come with some downsides. Um, it means potting soil is really rich. It's very easy for plants to grow in. So a, a plant that's gotten used to being in potting soil just may, may take a little while to adapt to our native soil. That may slow them down a little bit or cause them some problems. Um, they're definitely more difficult to transport unless you're getting just a few. You probably are going to want a truck. Um, I have shoved a bunch into the backseat of a car. It is messy and I might not recommend it. Um, another downside of that potting soil is it is a place um, to transport weeds around. Uh, so just, you, you know, it can be helpful to go through your pots before getting them in the ground, but we can't really account for anything that hasn't sprouted yet and is still in that seed stage. Bare root plants and plugs are another great option. So bare roots, like you see on the left there, these are grown in a field much like a food crop. And then once the plants go dormant in the winter, 
they are lifted out of the ground and the soil is stripped away from the roots. So you'll receive them exactly as you see in that photo um, with the roots just kind of hanging out there. Uh, plugs are grown in extremely small containers. You can see even see the shape of the container in that photo there. And they're just very young plants. Um, and and oftentimes with plugs, you'll see you'll see the plants that have those more fibrous root systems than like a tree. Um, plugs and bare roots can be great because they can be really, really cheap. Definitely the cheapest option at one to two dollars a plant. Um, because they're not in potting soil, they're able to adapt to native soils really, really well. They're easy to transport. You can generally fit, you know, hundreds of these in a bag, throw them in the backseat of your car. It's not messy. Um, you're not going to have a problem with that. They do have the narrowest planting window because they're not available um, till they've really, really gone dormant in the winter. Um, we generally don't even have access to them until, until January at the earliest. Um, so you're more limited in when you can plant them and you can't really leave them to sit at your site because we really don't want those roots to dry out. Um, they can be more difficult to find suppliers, although uh, King Conservation District, as well as many of the other conservation districts in our area, do bare root native plant sales every year. So you have that option. Uh, because their roots are a little a little more exposed and more delicate, they, they can require more skilled planting, but I think it's definitely an achievable skill for anybody. And like I said, you do need to be careful of, of not drying out those roots. We'll send you information for what's called healing in, which would be a temporary way to protect those roots from drying out. And there is a potential for higher mortality rates than with potted plants. Live stake is an option that you have for just a few different species, but for plants that grow in really wet areas um, like willow, red osier, dogwood, cottonwood, and black twinberry, this can be a really cool way um, to get a lot of plants in the ground really cheaply. Uh, you can see that person is holding a stick. That is a live stake. It was probably cut off of a live plant in the area um, and then will be stuck about half or two thirds of the way into some very, very wet soil where it will grow. Um, so they're great for wet sites where there's like dense reed canary grass that we can try to shade out with these stakes. Potentially you can harvest them on site for free if, if you have somewhere to do that. They're really easy to transport and they're not that delicate because they're just sticks and they can be really fun to harvest and plant because you, like I said, you're just sticking sticks into ground. It's kind of, and then waiting for them to become trees. <laughs> um, this list over here really is the list of plants we would recommend to live stake. So this is not a general option planting. They can have higher mortality. So we generally recommend that you live stake very densely to account for that. And you aren't going to see much growth in the first year because during the first year, the that is plant is really going to be focused on putting out roots from the node points that are below the ground. You might see a couple leaves the first year, but they're really going to take off um, a couple years in. If you're working somewhere with beavers, um, we don't recommend this because you're really just adding beaver snacks. Okay, so when to plant is a little different for these three different stock types. In general, in the Pacific Northwest, our planting season is during our rainy fall and winter. So these are general month guidelines, but definitely pay attention to the, the climate conditions at the time of your planting. I generally recommend people not start planting until we have started getting our fall rains. Container plants can be planted through that whole fall and winter window. Um, live stakes should only be planted in really the wettest, um, the wettest, coldest part of that window. And then bare root plants can be planted, you know, from when they're available around January, kind of through the end of the period. In general, the more plant time you have plants to the more time your plants have to grow and establish those root systems really well before our soil dries out, um, the more likely they will make it through our dry summer. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I hope you all have fun with your native plants and Jackie will, Jackie will be ready to answer all of your questions. Lovely. Well, we've got lots of great questions pouring in. I'll uh, probably 
uh, toss a few back and forth with you, Maddie, and get your thoughts as well. Um, the last few questions, which I'll, I'll just get to first since I've been staring at them for a moment. Um, we're getting some questions about what species you can use for live staking. Does rooting hormone help with live stakes? Um, one thing to keep in mind with live staking is that you will, of course, have lower survival ship um, with those plants than with other methods, some um, with bare root plants or with plugs. And usually the species that we select for live staking are the toughest, you know, the quickest growing. So while it's possible to propagate a lot of other species from cuttings, um, we'd recommend giving them a lot more care um, than the species used for live staking. Those are just really robust. So if you want to try um, using rooting hormone, propagating those cuttings very carefully, you can. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll probably have lower survivorship and uh, will maybe want a little closer attention than your willows and your poplars who just really take off. Um, one question that I wanted to chat a bit with you about, Batty. Uh, Diana was asking, given the number of rabbits in Seattle, it would be good to know which native plants are unpalatable to rabbits. <laughs> Big question. So, of course, we've got some things that are very spiky, very unpalatable, things like your low Oregon grape, tall Oregon grape. Um, really, nobody wants to eat that. Um, sword fern is another one that's a, that's a possible relatively browse resistant species. Um, any that jump out to you, Maddie, is being. Yeah, I would go definitely for thorny plants. Um, definitely for plants with like more of that, like kind of spiky texture, those leaves that are more difficult to eat. Um, I do, I hear, you know, people tell me, oh, I've never had a problem with rabbits eating this plant in my yard. And then someone else says, well, they ate it all in my yard. So I do think there's some trial and error to do. Um, and I do think protecting your plants with a little cage when they're young, if you're able to do that, um, that might get you a faster start than that trial and error of like really figuring out what the rabbits where you live won't eat. For sure. And another thing to keep in mind is that some plants are really vulnerable when they're newly planted, when they're tiny. And of course, one bite can take out the whole plant. But if you're able to protect the plants, be with a cage or be with a little tube, um, whatever works for you. Um, if you can get it to uh, a bit of a mature state before you unleash any rabbits on it, um, they'll do a lot better. And that goes for even things like shrubs and trees, which can be really damaged by uh, rodent herbivory or deer herbivory when they're small, but are more resistant. Let's be a question there. Um, I will quickly address this one. I did answer this in the comments, but we're asked, um, is KCD staff available for on-site consultations? Um, my recommendation would be to uh, head over to our website and our Better Backyards tab has a button at the bottom of it that says request assistance. And often what we'll ask is for folks to send over a, a photo of your problem area and uh, and whatever questions, whatever challenges you're encountering. Um, sometimes if it's, a, if it's a significant undertaking or if you're potentially looking at having a whole stream restoration on your property, um, we'll come up for a site visit, but often we'll wind up corresponding by email, sharing photos and we can get a lot of problems dealt with that way. Ben Weevil shared a great question. He asked, what sites and sources do you recommend for evaluating how beneficial any given native plant is for local insects and fauna? You mentioned Grand Fur supply over 125 caterpillars and insects with nutrients. Is there a centralized data source listing such stats about more of the plants you're discussing here and others? Um, so, one thing I wanted to mention off the bat is that if, if you have the space and, and if you're able, it's great to attempt to plant the, the broadest diversity of native plants you can. And look as well at when they're providing their services, be that flowers, be that fruit, be that shelter for wildlife, when they're providing that through the year. So you and the wildlife will... Uh, get the, the greatest benefit from your yard with, you know, a, a wide period um, with diversity in, in heights and shapes of native plants. Um, that's a great place to start. 
if you are looking for what's going to thrive and support the ecosystem where you're located, um, I'd recommend it if you can to get out to a local park and just see what the structure is in natural areas um, near where you live. And that can kind of clue you in to what does well in your soil, what does well at your elevation, um, and what wildlife is using there. Uh, Maddie, do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, so there actually is a website where you can search for, you can search both in the moth butterfly direction and in the plant direction. I am trying to find it. Uh, so look for that in your email because it does exist. Outstanding. Uh, ben also asked, are there nurseries uh, that have designated native plant sections full time? Um, so I shared in the chat briefly, but you can also find on KCV's website, we have a list of native plant nurseries um, in our area. So it's tough to say which nurseries are supporting native plants full time as stock can kind of vary throughout the year and from year to year. Um, but we encourage you guys to explore that list, um, call around to nurseries, and many have an updated availability list on their website that gets updated every few weeks or few months. So that's a great resource. I see a question from Brenda asking, what's the best time to scatter seeds for pollinator flowering plants? And what's the best technique? Um, that's, a, that's a tough question, Brenda. Um, one thing I'll say is um, a lot of seed mixes or specific seeds that you are scattering will have recommendations on the packet. Um, you can also look up that specific variety or that specific seed mix. And sometimes they'll say this seed mix requires winter stratification. Um, and what that means is that some seeds need a period of cold and sometimes moist before things get warm in the summer to kind of clue them in that it's time to start growing. Um, so I would recommend typically sowing your seeds either in the fall um, sometimes in the spring and a smaller subset of seeds can be sown anytime. They don't need that acclimation period, um, but it really depends on what variety uh, you're seeding. So I would, yeah, do a, do a bit of poking around about your specific plant you're trying to grow. Brett asked, uh, do you have any tips for protecting small bare root plants from bunnies and deer in the first couple of years? Um, one thing that we use a lot, especially on our bare root plants, um, it helps if they're small and not too bushy, is we use um, tree tubes, which are available from some forestry suppliers. Um, so they come flat and you can uh, attach a stake to the tube so you can stick it in the ground and then wrap it and kind of snap it around that plant. Um, and that will provide that extra layer of protection for your plants from herbivores. Elizabeth asks, I have a really hard time finding native plants for very hot, dry, and sandy areas. Any ideas? One challenge here is that these hot, dry, sandy areas are maybe not that common in nature around where we live in the Puget Sound lowlands, but we've created a lot of them through our development of these areas. One, uh, what I would call a, a, a reference ecosystem is our, uh, our outwash prairies. So there is a group of ecosystems native to the Puget Sound lowlands, which are prairies, and they have the beautiful Gary Oak, which Matt mentioned, um, and they have really tough bunch grasses. There's something called Romer's fescue, which is very dominant in those systems. Um, if you head over to our native plant uh, sale site, there are a few suggestions for things like nodding onion, which are adapted to that kind of ecosystem and are really tough and can handle dry sites, sharp drainage. Um, yeah, I would recommend that you research plants that you find attractive and that are native to the prairies of the Puget Sound lowlands. And those have the greatest attention to be well in those sites. Stephanie asks, what does moist conditions mean? Are irrigation lines enough or do you need to plant adjacent to a water body? 
uh, I believe in this particular case, um, you do have a little bit of play. Uh, any any thoughts, Maddie, on you know, on how you would recommend they use your recommendation? Yeah. So um, I would actually recommend that kind of the great thing about native plants is that. Um, once they get established, once they're growing strong, you shouldn't need to water them. So if you are trying to plant moist plants in a place that isn't moist and you need to water them, my recommendation would probably be to, to pick a different plant, um, which I understand can be hard if, if there was, you know, that moisture loving plant that you just really, really loved. Um, when I am thinking about moist soil, um, it's soil that, that, um, holds on to water where the water like doesn't drain through really quickly. One really simple way to kind of test the texture of your soil and learn more about how it's going to hold on to water is called the ribbon test. Um, so you can either Google the ribbon test, but I'll also send out a resource that has directions. Many resources will walk you through how to do it, and it, it essentially you're 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 feeling the texture of the soil in your fingers. Um, the more you can kind of the more malleable your soil is, the more it's going to be considered moist. Um, you can also look for look for clues like after a rainstorm, is water really pooling in an area, or is it draining through quickly? Um, that pooling is going to indicate that it's more wet, right? Um, you can go out a few days after it's rain and do a little digging and just kind of feel the texture of that soil um, and and keep an eye on kind of how long it holds on to moisture. Um, you, sh you, you likely will not need to be right next to a water body to have what is considered moist soil. Uh, but when we do think about our glacial outwash, you know, that soil is generally not considered moist. It is very well drained. Um, so while you don't need to be near near a water body to have moist soil, um, many of our Puget Sound hills where that glacial outwash is are not necessarily going to be moist themselves unless they have, you know, that high hard pan where that water it's helping that water really pool or you are next to a water body. Um, but I would encourage people um to yeah to think about plants that will grow in the growing conditions you have um and maybe you're going to hand water them for the first summer or two to really get them established and then after that ideally right we're not having to water these plants mm -hmm. sure and one thing to keep in mind as well uh, and you know we we can kind of become used to this and forget about this but in the winter the entire Puget Sound lowland is very moist, so it's more the summer condition that we're worried about. Um, if you have an area that doesn't have water input in the summer when it's not raining so much, it's going to be quite dry. But the plants that require moisture will often require that year round. So something that we are billing as drought tolerant, um, often that means it's it's drought tolerant in the, in the summer. That's the only time it has the opportunity to show that particular perk. Right. Oh, we have a question from Georgina on a sword fern. I have a root clump that is not producing leaves. Why might that be? Also, can I split the root clump? Um, I have not heard of success with sword fern root clump splitting. Maddie, <laughs> I've yeah. done it. Give it a go. It worked for me. Um, I my guess is. If you have a root clump that's already not growing well, I don't know if that's like going to be the thing that makes it grow, but, and it's very hard to say why your sword fern isn't leafing out without, you know, that even if we were, were looking at the sword fern, it might be hard for us to answer that question. Um, it seems like you may as well try splitting it if it's already not growing. Because I've definitely had luck splitting live and healthy sword ferns. But it sounds like, Jackie, maybe you haven't. You know, I I haven't had a lot of luck. But I know often when I see sword ferns that are struggling, it's because they are, they're just hanging on in kind of a dry condition. Um, so a lot of our native plants that 
would love to establish under a dense canopy of evergreens. They love, you know, moist conditions, high soil organic matter. They can survive when they're not getting that, but they won't necessarily thrive. So sometimes, you know, we need to help them along a bit with a little extra water or a little extra soil organic matter, or maybe a shock to the system from splitting that root ball. So yeah, all manner of things you can try. Um, Faith asks, how do you determine whether soil type is dry, moist, or wet? It determines, it depends on the time of year. It does indeed. And uh, I really like Maddie's suggestion with, you know, going in and, and feeling your soil texture. So if you take a, a bit of soil and you ball it up in your fist, and then you open your fist, does it stay in a round little ball because it's clay? Does it fall apart because it's sandy? Um, and you could just check in on it through the year as well. You know, go give it a little squish with your foot in the spring. Does it hold a lot of water? And then if you go to the same spot a little later, does it not hold water any longer? Does it feel dry? Does it feel crunchy? Um, so yeah, just, just keep an eye on it through the year and try to get a sense for that soil texture. Now, you can have a situation where you have a free draining soil that is wet. You can have sand that Although if it was high on a hill, wouldn't hold any water. If it's beside a creek, it'll stay moist all the time. So it kind of depends on your understanding both your soil texture and how much water it wants to hold and how much water it's getting access to through how water moves across your property and that sort of thing. Okay. Ah, Sarah asks, uh, is it reasonable to order literally 50 sword ferns? I'm planting a huge area uh, already populated with mature trees. The ground is fully covered with ivy before, and I'm hoping to fight back regrowth. I think it sounds like a great plan. We definitely do that. And uh, sword ferns, especially if they're getting you know, enough moisture and if they have that protection for mature trees, that's something that we plant a lot on our restoration sites. And, uh, and we'd love to see that and hopefully uh, with, you know, a little maintenance and, and a little bit of control of any ivy that crops up, you'll be on the way to a beautiful sore fern carpet very soon. Ah. Jackie, I see a question about um, amending soil for native plants. Mm -hmm. I am scrolling back up Get to it. find it because I think that's one that people commonly have. Um I am Sorry, I should not have scrolled away. I can read that to you if you already. If you oh, want. yeah. Do you have it? Yes. So Lene asks, do you typically amend soil before you plant natives? I have a particularly dry spot adjacent to a western hemlock. and I've had a hard time establishing anything there, even with twice a week watering in the summer. Yeah. So I would say kind of similar to the water question, um, like the beauty of native plants is, is that they shouldn't need soil amendments, that they are adapted to grow in these like less nutritious soils than like a veggie would be. Um, and I think if you're, if you're dealing with this like really dry soil, um, especially like under a conifer, that mulch could be really helpful and kind of just building up that soil and improving its moisture holding compatibility capacity um through some some heavy mulching might might be helpful there i don't know if you have any other suggestions jackie i think that sounds great yeah we typically don't amend the soil when we're planting native plant installations what we do do is um look around the area to see what's thriving um try to get a sense for how much uh, organic material is in the soil and how free draining the soil is. And we tend to adapt the plants to the site um, rather than trying to adapt the site to the plants. It just works a lot better. Uh, Harmony asked, you mentioned Nutka Rose as a rapid spreader. Are there other bushes or ground cover that are rapid spreaders? Um, Nutka Rose, definitely a great one. Um, it depends a bit on what kind of conditions you're working with. Some things like willows and red osier dogwood can spread like crazy in a moist condition. Um, and indeed, a lot of those um, areas really favor the growth of, of shrub thickets. Um, Douglas spirea is another great clumping plant for a moist condition. Um, in the upland, things tend not to be as dense. 
Um, you can get a beautiful, moderately dense thicket of something like uh, beaked hazelnut. Um, trying to think here. Ground cover that are rabbit spurters as well. Um, sword ferns do moderately well. You may have to plant a few as they don't tend to propagate themselves very quickly. Um, any other thoughts on the upland there, Maddie? Or um, I would say kinikinik is a good spreading ground cover option that can do well in drier areas. That's a beautiful one for sure. Karen asks, all my Gary Oaks died. Is there a trick to help them get established? I have heard that Gary Oaks are tricky. Um, it's definitely, yeah, they're, they're tough plants to get going. Um, one suggestion that I would have is to make sure they're in a soil that is right for them. Um, they don't want to be in super wet conditions. Um, as I mentioned with the, the prairie ecosystem uh, aside, they do like kind of a more gravelly, more sandy soil. Um, so even if you have an area that's maybe not so gravelly or not so sandy, um, you can amend the soil there with a little bit of sand. Um, you can try to plant it in a higher elevation area in your yard. If you're planting it really low, um, somewhere where water pools and you may have challenges. Any other tips for us, Maddie, on Gary Oak survival? Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's exactly it. It's like if the habitat isn't right for them, they're not going to do well. And there is only so much you can do to change your habitat, even though that they're a plant that like, I understand why you want them to grow um, where you are. They're, they're so beautiful. They're so cool. They have so many benefits. Um, but I think really looking into their preferred growing conditions, um, what soils they like, and then learning as much about your soils and your site as possible to see if, if it really makes sense for them to be planted where you are. If you feel like you do have the right site conditions and they're just not growing anyway, um, then then maybe it's worth doing a little bit more investigation. Mm -hmm. Karen asks, what grows well under maple trees or should I just put wood chips down to keep the weeds away? Um, wood chips can definitely be helpful and it can be nice to kind of have that helping hand while you're trying to get native plants established. Sometimes they'll establish a little slower than, uh, than weedy non-native species, which are much more adapted to, you know, blow in on the wind. Um, but you have a lot of options under maple trees. Um, you can do things like, like vine maples, smaller maples. Um, you can grow some beautiful understory shrubs like beaked hazelnut. Um, sword ferns should do really well. And I think knick-knick is another great choice. Yeah got a lot a lot of options and uh yeah they tend to that that leaf litter created by a big leaf maple is kind of a natural mulch so it's a, it's a great place to start it establishing a native plant garden rebecca asks could you say a bit more about how to use king county imap I will send out, we have a little, re, we have a different resource that includes a video tutorial for how to use IMAP and I will send that out. Excellent. Oh, got a, an interesting question. Given the warming climate, can you speak to the wisdom or not of considering California natives that is sourcing from a slightly warmer neighbor ecosystem? This is a tough one. And my instinct is to say we, We'll often have some overlap in our floras, considering that we are adjacent to California. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in this, you can look at, you know, where do we have overlap with, for instance, Northern California's flora? Um, yeah, it's a tough one because we may be supporting a very different wildlife, very different insect life than exists in California at the moment. Um, so it's hard to kind of see where climate change may take us in the future and, and what animals we may be supporting. So typically I advise that uh, folks look at supporting the wildlife that's that's in their backyard right now, day to day. What do you think, Patty? Yeah, I would say you said very similar. To what I would say there's just so much we don't know. And depending on, on which botanist, which horticulturist, which climate scientist you talk to, you're probably going to get a different answer. Um, but I do generally probably lean on the kind of middle ground of like, yeah, like um, 
there are plenty of native plants that are native to us and native to California, but maybe sourcing them from a warmer climate means that those specific plants are more adapted to what our climate will look like. Um, I think it's also good to think about the difference in lifespan of a plant where a tree that we plant now could be alive in 250 years when we have a very different climate. That might be a time when you're like, yeah, maybe I want to you know, source that seed from the Willamette Valley instead of the Puget Lowlands um, versus like a shrub or ground cover is probably not going to be alive. They have a much shorter generation time. So maybe they can adapt with our change in climate. Um, yeah, I think we're all, <laughs> this is something we're definitely like learning about as it happens. Um, and I think related is the question that just got asked about, should we be planting more drought tolerant plants as the summers are getting drier? Um, I think this is related. Certainly pay attention to the conditions, you know, that you're seeing. Um, if you're seeing that your plants are struggling to make it through the summer, then yeah, I think this was probably a good time to transition to those more drought tolerant plants um, or like sourcing seeds from, from droughtier areas than us. Um, yeah, I tend to kind of agree with Jackie that that the I think the question of like assisted migration of like, should we be, you know, planting sequoias here? Um, it is a little harder to, to answer because of, of that question of like the wildlife and how they're going to fit into our niche here. But certainly there are people who are really interested in that. So. We have a question from Susan. She says, I live right on Puget Sound at the bottom of a hill. What is good to plant in shady, sandy soil? I do have salal, evergreen huckleberry, sword ferns, and strawberries growing down the hill. We're looking for shrubs and low-lying plants. Yeah, definitely a lot of options on a site like that. Um, you could consider things like beaked hazelnut. I keep coming back to it, but it is a beautiful plant. Um, you can explore uh, some creeping natives as well. We have things like our uh, native black-capped raspberry that you can explore. Um, more ferns are definitely an option. You can look at deer fern, which goes nicely with sword ferns, but has a bit of a different look. Um, and then things like kinikinik are another option, uh, a nice ground cover that can handle uh, dry soils. Ben asks, does KCD recommend a native prairie wildflower seed mix? I can send out places to source native wildflower seed mix. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of information um, about like the diff, depending on your conditions, you're going to want a different mix. But um, I do have a couple different resources. I can't like recommend a private business um, because we are a government agency, but I'm happy to share the local places that are that are selling those definitely native mixes. Nan asks, mountain hemlock and alpine fir are native evergreen trees are native to the neighboring mountains and stay smaller for urban backyards. Are they beneficial for wildlife in our Puget Sound lowland? That's a tough question. Um, I think they would be beneficial for wildlife. You may not have as much benefit to your immediate local wildlife as a plant that's adapted to your specific elevation. Um, they may still be good choices. Um, one thing to consider, though, is when you're growing these mountain species, the um, wet dry cycle can be a bit different. So whereas in the lower elevations, plants are getting rained on all winter, if plants are accustomed to being snowed on, they're not necessarily soaking wet for the whole winter. They're accustomed to being a little drier and then being really soaked when spring snow melt happens. Um, so that can be a challenge when growing these plants that prefer to grow on a mountain in the lowland, but it's worth a try and they are very beautiful. Uh, Donita asks, what's the best way to eradicate English ivy? Um, well, there's many ways you could tackle that. And, and there's many ways that we do tackle that when we tackle big infestations. Um, if it's a small area of English ivy that you wanted to control, um, you can manually remove it. 
And if you uh, tackle it in just the right way, if you start to peel it up, um, you can actually roll it up almost as if you're rolling up a carpet. And one thing you want to make sure is that that ivy is no longer in contact with the ground because it can't <laughs> reroot again, even in its rolled up carpet form. Um, but that's, you know, what I recommend for a ground uh, cover of ivy. When it's moving up a tree, often we recommend just cutting it at the base of the tree um, because that ivy is actually getting its water and its nutrients from the ground and then moving those nutrients, sugars, water up the tree. So if you're cutting it at the base of the tree, that ivy will, whatever's moved up the tree will typically die, will desiccate and you can pull it down given some time. Um, when you're hand removing ivy, you may need to kind of keep up with the control for a little while until you ensure that you've got it all. Um, and if you're dealing with a really enormous area of ivy, um, you can hire a, a pesticide applicator um, or, or look into uh, herbicides to um, knock that ivy back. But often we employ a combination of herbicide, manual removal, and ongoing control. So. And I'll share out a resource too in this follow-up email that we'll do a real deep dive on weed removal. Excellent. Yeah. So that's a big topic. You did a great overview, Jackie. Thank you. No worries. Uh, Brett asks, any specific recommendations for native plants that can drink a lot of water in a soggy area? Absolutely. Um, some that we recommend as being great for this are things like willow shrubs, or if you're in a tree kind of mood, we do have some tree-sized willows. Um, Pacific willow is a great choice and very beautiful willow species. Um, our smaller willows are things like scowler's willow, sitka willow, which stay a little shorter. Um, but they're also very thirsty, very fast growing and can do things like stabilize your soil and that can help you deal with flood problems and, and this sort of thing. Um, another good option is red osier dogwood. And some of these shrubs are also, um, they tend to be thicket forming. So not only are they thirsty, but they'll make more of themselves. Um, so that's very, very helpful. All right. Oh, Anne asks, is there a native ground cover that can <laughs> chickens? They stripped my backyard. All that's left is Oregon grapes, salal, and evergreen trees. That is very unfortunate. I have not had this struggle with chickens. Have you won any, won any sparring matches with chickens in the garden mantle? Yeah, um, I have chickens and I do find that especially like a plant that isn't already like very established, they're going to get to. Um, so definitely those woody plants, definitely like all of those plant protection measures that we put in place for um, herbivores, I would recommend trying out like especially cages that kind of keep the chickens away from their root system. Um, your other option, of course, is to contain your chickens away from your native plants rather than your native plants away from your chickens. Um, but yeah, this is another one where, you know, if you've had good luck with certain species, I would maybe just do more of those. And then maybe you want to try a few um, with some protection measures and see if you can get them big enough to get established that way. Absolutely. Oxford Speeds are a great resource. Um, Anna asks, I just moved to a yard in the Snoqualmie Valley that had a lot of cedars and firs along the edges between us and the gravel road. The previous owners limbed them up to 10 feet. Do you have suggestions for evergreen shrubs and other plants that can help fill that space? There's not a lot of direct sunlight. That's a definite tough one. Um, a couple of evergreen recommendations for you would be actually more cedars um, and western hemlock, um, especially in a situation where you have moist soils, those trees are relatively shade tolerant. So as opposed to things like our Douglas fir, who is so famous, that loves to grow in sun, um, things like our red cedar, like our Western hemlock, um, are very shade tolerant and don't mind growing underneath other trees. Um, 
Yeah, a few uh, berry might be a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, beaked hazelnut may be a winner. Um, vine maple is another option. Um, very handsome will add some interesting shape and doesn't mind growing in the understory. Uh, yeah, and you can always look at some ferns, look at some ground covers. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, any other thoughts there, Maddie? Yeah, I would say evergreen huckleberry um, maybe. I'm trying to think of more evergreens. Um, if it's dry, rhododendrons might not do great, but they can do the shade. Um, I had one in my head. For, I think sword ferns are a good option um, for, they often can grow places that other things struggle to grow. Certainly, yeah. So oh, evergreen privacy shrub, definitely evergreen huckleberry. Excellent. And uh, some salal may do well in a condition mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, they quite like a moist, shady spot. That's kind of their, their sweet spot to establish. So that might give you kind of a, a mix of heights there. Cool. Oh, um. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. It's so great to have your extensive plant knowledge with us today. I am going to end us on time. 